All right, guys, let's get started. Um, so today we're going to look at period four, which is basically the election of Jefferson through the era of good feelings, the Second Great Awakening, um, and then some of the other social, cultural, and economic developments in this period. Um, we don't really look at foreign policy here. Um, we'll look at that in the next one. I know technically the 1840s overlaps with some of the westward expansion. Um, so other than like the War of 1812 and some of the early issues, um, we tend to look at that as part of like sectionalism and the buildup to the Civil War. Um, so, let's, uh, so let's jump in. So you know that um, we left off looking at um, John Adams and how Adams had kind of a, a controversial presidency, right? You know, he in 1800 loses to Jefferson, who was his vice president. Remember, the, the presidential elections were a little different back then. Um, and a lot of why he lost was because of this kind of growing support for Democratic Republicans as opposed to Federalists. Um, you know, the Federalists were increasingly seen as this elite group that didn't really represent the average person. Um, and, uh, and as a result, um, you know, Jefferson and, and the Democratic Republicans are able to kind of sweep in in, in 1800. Um, so when we talk about Jefferson, um, he had a very different view of what the United States should be compared to uh, Adams and the Federalists. Um, Jefferson, in a lot of ways, saw the United States as becoming a society of primarily farmers. Um, like if you asked Jefferson and his supporters what they saw as the ideal American, um, they would say the, the small, independent farmer um, and would kind of see the society as being, you know, consistently made of those. Now, obviously that points out some, some hypocrisies. Jefferson himself was this very wealthy planter, but you see that a lot with the, the planter elite is they, they push this kind of agrarian view. Um, politically, Jefferson wanted a much more limited federal government. Remember, he wasn't really in favor of a national bank. It was a compromise with Hamilton. Um, he supported states' rights over uh, a strong central government and presidency. Um, but again, during his presidency, we'll see him kind of break from that. Um, and, uh, and he was also, to his credit, an education guy. He wanted to, he's one of the very first Americans to really propose some sort of like universal public education. Um, he wanted to focus on things like the scientific revolution, the enlightenment. Um, he basically wanted a, a very well-educated um, you know, kind of small farmer society. And the one thing about small farmers that maybe we, we don't think of today um, is, remember back in the, in the early 1800s, being a small farmer was kind of the equivalent of being um, like a small business owner today. Um, so it wasn't just about farming. Um, you know, Jefferson liked the idea of people being financially independent. So in a, in a strange way, you know, it's, it's also kind of a pitch for, um, for basically a lot of small business owners, but the, obviously agricultural businesses. Um, so as we uh, as we look into um, some of the other things going on during this time period, before we get into some of the specific kind of political issues, um, you see that like the early 1800s is really when people in the United States start to think of themselves as being American, um, and you see this kind of establishment of like the the national culture, if you will. Um, so there's a pretty strong push. A lot of this is because of guys like, like Jefferson to eliminate the, the last vestiges of like aristocracy. Remember English nobles had colonial holdings. Um, you know, there are a lot of ties with England. So you still have a little bit of that old kind of European, um, look. And, uh, and so there was a push for that. Um, and some of it was symbolic, but some of it was actually pretty, pretty substantial. So like Noah Webster, um, he, uh, he, simplified the English language um, and made it more quote unquote like American. Um, if you know, like there's a lot of words in um, British English that have like an O-U, like color is C-O-L-O-U-R. Um, so like he's one of the people who said, hey, let's get rid of the U's and all of those words. Um, you know, basically, again, trying to create as many both kind of superficial as well as significant separations from uh, from British and English culture as possible to make the United States and American culture its own unique thing. Um, you saw uh, Thomas Paine wrote The Age of Reason at this point. Um, there's a kind of uh, 
a change in the way that religion is looked at in the United States. Deism becomes very popular. Um, Jefferson was a deist. Remember, deism is Christian, um, but it's this belief that, you know, God basically exists, but doesn't really interfere in human affairs anymore. So, you know, things like praying are not needed. Um, and uh, it's, it's really an, an attack on kind of traditional uh, Protestant and Catholic uh, Christian faith um, and a look at an attempt to modernize but not eliminate it. Um, which again was seen in this time period as a context of like making religion uniquely American. Um, we'll talk about the Second Great Awakening more later, but in a religious sense, you also see like shifts in some of the Protestant faiths. Um, you see the growth of groups like the Methodists and the Baptists. Um, you start to see, um, you know, kind of breaks from a lot of those older, more closely linked to Puritanism religions. Um, so, so in that sense, we see a cultural change. Um, you also start to see technology impact American culture in this time period. Um, even though Jefferson is looking at a society being, you know, made pretty consistently of small farmers, um, you actually see industrialization start to uh, really take off during his presidency. Um, Eli Whitney invents the cotton gin, and this starts to become popular in the early 1800s. Um, the cotton gin we'll talk about later with slavery too, but the cotton gin was a tremendous economic boom because it made the South almost exclusively a cotton producing region. Um, it created a new cash crop to replace tobacco. And then in the North, it created this huge demand to establish um, textile factories. Remember, textiles were the first part or the first real wave of industrialization before the heavy industry that we looked at in the, in the very beginning of this school year. Um, so you start to see this kind of symbiotic relationship between the North and the South, where the South would be the producer of the raw materials, the cotton, the dyes, like indigo and things like that. And then they would ship all those raw materials up to the North, where the Northern textile factories would produce them and then sell them both in the domestic market and begin to export them to Europe as well. Um, so you also saw Eli Whitney develop the concept of uh, interchangeable parts, which originally he did with guns, but eventually was used for everything. And this was a huge boom for industry. Because if you think about it prior to this, you know, anything mechanical in the United States was made pretty much custom. Um, so, you know, whether it was a gun or a tool or, you know, any sort of like mechanical thing, um, you would have to go to a Smith and basically have them build it for you from scratch. And then if it broke, you had to bring it back to the same person um, and they would have to custom make a new part. So when Whitney developed this idea of, of interchangeable parts, um, in a lot of ways, it's like the very beginnings of Taylorism or of mass production, which, you know, we've talked about in, uh, in more recent times. Um, you also saw transportation play a really major role in kind of the shifting um, nature of like what really defined the United States and, and how the United States grew um, both culturally and economically. So, you know, you think about it, even at its smallest, right, when the American Revolution was over, um, the United States was still the largest country, at least in the Western world, you know. Um, it had, you know, a much larger landmass than most of the European powers um, and far less people. So it was really spread out. So it was really hard for, um, you know, Americans to not just communicate, but uh, trade with each other, you know, travel, any of those things. Um, and if you can't do that, it's really hard to create like a unified American culture. Um, so another technological innovation that helped with this was uh, the steam engine. Uh, not as much for trains at this point, that's more of like a post-Civil War thing, but for steamboats. Um, you know, Fulton develops the steamboat um, or the, the modern steamboat. And um, this becomes the major way that people travel because while the U.S. has a lot of rivers, um, remember without steam power, you can't travel upriver, right? Because you're going against current. So um, when these larger steamboats start to get built, what it enables the United States to do is um, to have trade and communication and commerce um, with really the entire country. You know, you could get on a boat in Ohio uh, and you could take it without getting off all the way down to New Orleans. Um, you know, you could take a boat from New York City up to the Canadian border. Um, you know, all the major rivers in the United States become um, some of the bigger highways, basically. Um, and then in more populated areas, you also see um, 
like turnpikes and roads and things like that getting set up. Um, so all of these have the impact of gradually starting to uh, grow the American, um, not just transportation network, but kind of sense of identity that people are able to, to interact with each other more frequently. Um, all right, so now let's get back into uh, to Jefferson's presidency a little bit. Um, so the first really major event of Jefferson's presidency um, is, is not necessarily something he controls. It's the, the Marbury-Madison issue. Um, remember, when uh, Adams loses the election, the famous story is that he was um, appointing judges up until midnight, right? the midnight appointments, um, and he was trying to flood the judicial branch with Federalists, uh, with the hope that a lot of Federalist judges could slow down any sort of Democratic-Republican legislation. Um, and uh, one of these judges was this guy Marbury, and his appointment never actually made it. So Jefferson's inaugurated, um, and Marbury will sue the Jefferson administration, and James Madison in particular, because Madison was in the cabinet, and his job had been to uh, deliver the appointments. So uh, Marbury sues, uh, and this goes all the way to the Supreme Court, um, and he sues claiming that uh, this act that no longer exists now called the Judiciary Act of 1789 um, basically forced Madison to, um, to appoint him to be a judge. And, uh, and what the Judiciary Act had said originally was that the Supreme Court is allowed to order the legislature to do basically anything he wants. Um, and, uh, and so this kind of interesting, uh, ruling comes about and it's really, I would say the most famous Supreme Court or not most famous, excuse me, um, the most important Supreme Court case in the history of the country, um, cause it basically defines what the court is, uh, and under John Marshall, the first chief justice, um, you see, uh, this decision where basically the court is, um, is going to nullify the Judiciary Act of 1789. Um, they're going to say that the Supreme Court does not have the power in the Constitution to order the legislature, the Congress, to do anything. Um, and you go, well, wait a minute, isn't that weakening the court? But in reality, it's actually strengthening it. Um, because by repealing uh, the Judiciary Act, by declaring it unconstitutional, you've actually given the court a much greater power than the ability to order Congress to do something. You've given the court the ability to declare laws unconstitutional, um, which is a check on not just the legislature, but also the presidency, right? Because you can use that against executive orders. You can use that against anything you want. Um, so by not appointing Marbury and by um, nullifying the Judiciary Act of 1789, um, you now establish really the modern purpose of the Supreme Court. Um, so that's a court case that's worth remembering. Now, going back to Jefferson's presidency, um, I think what we see is the, the really major event um, is, is one that's kind of like ironic, too, because it goes against a lot of what Jefferson believed about the presidency itself. You know, Jefferson wanted to shrink the size of the government, limit its power. Um, so when, um, when we get into his first term, uh, Jefferson approaches or has his, his representatives approach the French about buying New Orleans, right? France at this point controls the whole Louisiana territory. Um, and uh, he's kind of nervous about Napoleon. Um, remember, Napoleon's in charge now. You have the Napoleonic Wars going on. And he doesn't like the idea of this huge chunk of French territory and the port of New Orleans being under control of Napoleon because if Napoleon ever wanted to send troops, that would be a huge threat to the United States. Um, so he sends delegates and they will uh, approach the French and ask if they can just buy the port of New Orleans because that will guarantee American passage into the Gulf of Mexico, right? The Mississippi River is incredibly important as a, as a travel and trade artery. Um, and uh, the French will counter offer. And what the French basically say is, um, we won't sell you New Orleans, but we will sell you the entire Louisiana territory for $15 million, which was more than the delegates were authorized to spend. Um, but if you think about how much more territory that is, um, it was a tremendous, tremendous deal. Um, but Jefferson has this issue now because, you know, he's the small government guy, the I want to weaken the, the presidency guy. And um, this is a, a tremendous overreach of presidential power. Um, so of all things, Jefferson basically um, applies the necessary and proper clause that, you know, Hamilton had put in that, that Jefferson hated. Um, 
And, uh, and what he does is he says, I have the power to sign treaties as the president. Um, so he signs this treaty and kind of bypasses Congress. And the thing that makes this um, particularly kind of controversial in a constitutional sense is that, remember, Congress has the power of the purse. So by signing a treaty for more money than you were authorized to, he basically didn't ask Congress for the, the funding. Um, and Congress signs the checks for the United States. Um, so it was a, a big overreach. Now, no one criticizes him because it was such a good deal that obviously, you know, he had to make it. But it is kind of interesting that, you know, he will actually expand executive power in a way that I think he never would have wanted to when he first took office. Um, so the other really major event that doesn't necessarily come to a head during um, during Jefferson's administration, but it is, you know, kind of involved, is um, the War of 1812. So you know that the French and the British are now fighting, you know, on and off for, for at this point, almost a decade. Um, and um, one of the big issues, at least for the United States, was that the U.S. tried to trade with both countries, um, and both countries were seizing American ships bound for the, the opponent. Um, and while the French ultimately stopped doing this, the British will continue to impress American sailors, right, basically kidnapping them and stopping American ships all the way through the early 1800s. Um, now, Jefferson attempts to stop this uh, with what he called peaceable coercion. Um, he tried to embargo Britain and France, at least initially, too. Um, he refused to trade, uh, and it actually hurts the American economy because the United States basically needed the, the European trade more than the Europeans needed the Americans. Um, and uh, so the U.S. is going to kind of struggle through this period of time attempting to, um, to figure out a way to basically establish sovereignty to prevent foreign powers from, uh, from seizing American ships. Um, and this will culminate with uh, the Madison presidency because as Madison comes into office, um, you also start to see the British arming Native Americans on the American border and in the Western territories. Um, and this leads to some pretty severe uh, clashes with Native American tribes. Um, and, uh, and what you start to see is the growing push of this group in Congress called the Warhawks, which were, you know, these kind of Western frontier farmers. Um, and, uh, and in 1812, Madison is going to have to give in to congressional pressure, uh, and he'll ask Congress to declare war on Britain, and they will. Um, now, I don't think we need to go into too much depth about um, the war itself. Um, typically, you don't see a ton about the military in, um, in an AP test, especially the test that you're taking this year. So we'll just kind of briefly go over it. Um, you know, the War of 1812 is basically mixed. Um, the British and the Americans, neither one actually ever wins a decisive battle. Um, you know, other than New Orleans, which I would argue is not decisive because in New Orleans, um, you know, the, the war was already over. Um, I'd say that the, the big things you want to take out of the War of 1812 are, are the following. Um, one is because of the Battle of New Orleans, it leads to the rise of Andrew Jackson as a political figure, right? Um, two, the War of 1812 basically destroys the Federalist Party because during the war, you know, at the Hartford Convention, Federalists plot to have New England secede from the country, and this is discovered and fails. Um, that's the end of the Federalist Party. Uh, and three, at the end of the war, um, through the Treaty of Ghent, and then after that, in 1817, what's called the rush Bagot Treaty, um, the United States and Great Britain start to dramatically improve relations with each other. Um, you know, the War of 1812 is seen by a lot of people as almost like a sequel to the American Revolution, kind of the settling of the last of the scores. So um, by the end of the War of 1812, there's never really going to be a realistic chance of the, the British and the Americans going to war again. Um, and, uh, and as we move out of the, the end of the war, um, we kind of get back to some of the, the bigger kind of cultural and economic and, and political developments in the United States. Um, so one of the big ones that's going to come back when we talk about Jackson in a few minutes is the, uh, the establishment of the Bank of the U.S. So you know that the first Bank of the United States had been created during the Constitutional Convention um, with uh, the deal between Hamilton and Jefferson. Um, a lot of that was rooted in the fact that state banks were not regulated. Uh, they printed money. 
they were inconsistent, and as a result, there was never a stable currency in the United States. So the Bank of the United States was designed to kind of prevent that from happening anymore. Um, and uh, and so in 1811, when the bank expired, um, we went back to the old state system, and it was a mess. Um, so in 1816, um, the second bank of the United States is chartered for 20 years, um, and uh, obviously you know you do the math, you get into the 1830s. That's why Jackson's going to be the guy who does battle with it. Um, you also see the gradual increasing of tariffs at this point, um, which starts to lead to ultimately uh, the crisis under Jackson with nullification. Um, so tariffs continue to go up. We'll get more into those with Jackson too. Um, and, uh, and you also start to see a pretty big push for westward expansion. Uh, from 1800 to 1820, the population in the United States doubles. Uh, millions of people will move west of the Appalachians at this point. This is when you start to see a lot of those states in the uh, the Southwest, or at least the Southwest of this era: um, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky. You know, all of those states start to um, to uh, join the Union, um, and you also see more and more the uh, establishment of slavery in the cotton plantation system um, becoming really inexorably linked to uh, to Southern culture. Now, politically, um, this is what we now know as the era of good feelings, right? Um, you have Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, all Democratic Republicans winning the elections. Um, and even Monroe kind of going into that idea of the era of good feelings, right? There aren't a lot of political squabbles. He will appoint John Quincy Adams to be his Secretary of State, um, which is a big deal because Quincy Adams had been a Federalist. Um, so it kind of shows this idea of, um, you know, uh, how would I put it, um, you know, putting a lot of like the traditional kind of political squabbles aside. Um, there aren't a huge amount of events in this era. I would say that the, the, the two real big ones are the Adams-Onis Treaty, um, where the United States gained Spanish Florida during the Monroe uh, presidency. And then also the Monroe Doctrine is issued. Uh, which you know is where basically the United States says that uh, Europeans um, can't settle in the in the Western Hemisphere, right? Basically, the Western Hemisphere is off limits to colonization, um, and that only really works because the the British Navy backs the United States, right? Um, the one big kind of sectional issue that we should probably look at, even though we're not into the the run up to the Civil War, is um, you do also see the Missouri Compromise in 1820. Um, the Missouri Compromise, as you know, uh, deals with slavery, right? This is prompted because when Missouri applies to become a state, um, something is attached to it called the Talmadge Amendment, which attempts to ban slavery to make Missouri a free state. Uh, and what this would do is this would throw the balance out of free and slave states. Um, remember, you want to have a balance between free and slave states in this era because the pro-slavery faction said, well, if we're equal, then basically in the Senate, because um, the North had more population, but in the Senate, we'd have an equal number of senators, so the North would never be able to like abolish slavery out from under us. That was kind of the belief of the Southerners. Um, so when Missouri is, uh, is applies for statehood, and there's this push to make it a free state, uh, Henry Clay will retaliate, and he will block the admission of Maine, which was definitely going to be a free state. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, he will negotiate a compromise um, which admits Missouri as a slave state and Maine as a free state, and then also um, acknowledges that basically on the 3630 parallel, um, anything south of that would be admitted as a free state, uh, or excuse me, as a slave state, and anything north of that would be admitted as a, uh, a free state to the country. And the hope was that that would end the slavery debate. Um, obviously, you know, spoiler alert, it doesn't, uh, but it does kick the can down the road a little bit. Um, so what that leads us to is the, uh, the real big kind of political clash of the era, um, which is the corrupt bargain. Um, so in 1824, um, as we said, John Quincy Adams runs for president as the Secretary of State from James Monroe. However, he is challenged by Andrew Jackson, Henry Clay, and this guy by the name of Crawford, who you don't have to really worry about too much. Um, but when the four of them run, uh, we have an issue that should be reminiscent of the Adams and Jefferson elections. We have a contested election. Um, 
Basically, what happens is this. Jackson gets a plurality of the vote. He gets more popular votes and more electoral votes than anyone. However, he does not get the majority of the electoral vote. Uh, and what that means is no one's president. So according to the rules of the Constitution and the 12th Amendment, um, basically the top three vote getters have a runoff in the House of Representatives. Um, and this is where the corrupt bargain occurs because Henry Clay hates Andrew Jackson. He sees him as a threat. Uh, and Clay orders all of his supporters to vote for John Quincy Adams. And as a result, Quincy Adams gets the majority. Uh, he becomes president. And then he appoints Clay as the Secretary of State. Um, and as you know, at the time, Secretary of State was the heir to the presidency. You know, if you became Secretary of State, typically you would run for president after. Um, and, uh, and so what that did was that caused Jackson to feel like this was a, um, you know, a corrupt bargain, basically. Um, that it was a deal to kind of take the election away from him, to steal it. And, uh, and Jackson is enraged by this. He will basically dedicate the next four years to undermining John Quincy Adams pretty successfully. Uh, and, uh, and Adams will basically be a lame duck president his entire term. You know, he's a one term president. Um, and in 1828, Jackson will rush into the presidency. He'll, he'll crush Adams. Um, and he will usher in what we now know as the Jacksonian era. Um, so when we look at the, uh, the Jacksonian era, um, you know, we'll look at some of the specific kind of conflicts of his administration, but I want to talk a little bit first about like what that means. So, um, obviously we, we don't really think of Jackson as a, a positive figure. Um, and, and I think that's fair, you know, Jackson does a lot of really harmful things, particularly to native Americans. Um, he upholds slavery. He, um, he's going to do a lot of things that undermine the country economically. Um, but you have to remember, we're talking about the 1820s and 1830s, so context is important. And there are some ways in which Adam, or excuse me, Jackson is progressive, like for his era, all right, not by our standards today. So um, Jackson was a big proponent of what was called universal white male suffrage, uh, which basically meant any white man in the United States could vote now um, or run for office. Um, now, obviously, you hear that today and you go, that is not progressive at all. Um, but you have to remember in the 1820s who was allowed to vote and who wasn't. Um, in the 1820s, it was still fairly common in a lot of states for people who did not own property to not have the right to vote. Um, and I think the best example of this is in Massachusetts, which we think of as the most progressive state a lot of times, or one of the most progressive states in the country, even back then, um, you still had to own property to vote. So for a guy to come in and say, I don't care how poor you are, you, you should have the right to vote if you're a man, uh, you know, a, a white male in the United States, technically speaking, that was actually a step forward. Um, like I said, I'm not trying to pretend that Jackson is some, you know, hero of progressives, um, in a modern context, but for the time it was a step forward. And I think a lot of times people forget that and they don't really understand that. Um, and, and the reason I'm harping on it so much is it explains why he was so popular. Cause if you're a small farmer and you don't have a lot of land or you're a landless poor worker in a city, you know, Jackson's very appealing because basically he says, Hey, I want you to have a say in government. Um, now, on the flip side, he was vehemently pro-slavery. He did not believe that women should have any political say in the United States. As you know, he was vehemently anti-Native uh, American. Um, so there's a lot of backwards ideas, too. Um, but in that one way, um, which was a major, major political issue at the time, it was a huge debate, um, he was fairly progressive. Um, so once he takes office, uh, Jackson's kind of known for popularizing the spoil system. Jefferson's the first guy to do it, but Jackson kind of turns it into an art form. Um, you know that Jackson will appoint lots of his cronies to uh, government. Now his, his idea about that um, was not necessarily just to appoint friends, uh, but in addition, it was the idea that he didn't trust a lot of the government already. Um, remember, Jackson had a lot of political enemies. A lot of people saw him as a threat to the you know, the elites, Jackson really wanted to get rid of all of the northern, you know, industrial elite, uh, and also the southern planters, right? He didn't really trust southern planters because he said that they were all, you know, people who inherited their plantations. You know, he was a westerner. He was a, a self-made man in that sense. Um, so he didn't care 
This is something that's also kind of confused about Jackson sometimes. He didn't care if you were rich, but he wanted you to have made the money yourself. He didn't want you to have inherited it, basically. Um, so that's kind of where his, his political ideas come from. That's why he supports the little guy, you know, the, the landless farmers, because he said, hey, they could potentially rise too. Um, so the spoil system, um, you know, what we now call patronage, uh, which we talked about in the beginning of the year, um, in a lot of ways is a reaction to the fact that most of government was controlled by the elite, um, and, uh, and he wanted to remove them as much as possible. Um, now, when we get into his actual presidency, um, Jackson is uh, kind of unique in his political views. So he wants a small but a strong federal government. Um, in other words, he doesn't think the federal government should have a lot of say in what Americans do on a day-to-day -day basis, but the things that the federal government has authority over, it should have unquestioned authority over. And in addition to that, uh, the president himself should have unquestioned authority. Um, so instead of, you know, think of it like this, instead of the federal government having a little bit of influence in, you know, a hundred things, he wants the federal government and the president to have absolute control over like five or six things. Um, and that was kind of his belief. So um, what we see is that this kind of, you know, shows itself in, uh, in three major conflicts. Um, the nullification crisis with South Carolina, which we'll start with, the Indian removal issue um, with uh, the Indian Removal Act and, uh, and the defiance of the Supreme Court, uh, and then the banking battle, right, where he ultimately is going to destroy the, uh, the National Bank. Uh, so let's work through these. Um, so when we talk about nullification, um, this has to do with the tariff of abominations and those high import tariffs. Um, so remember, we said that in this time period, the federal government was gradually increasing tariffs, and this was done to protect uh, northern industry. Remember, northerners like high tariffs, southerners don't, because northerners wanted to protect American industry from, um, you know, basically competition from foreign goods, primarily Britain. Uh, and southerners wanted low tariffs because the South always exported cotton, right? American cotton was used all over the world. Um, so as a net exporter of agricultural goods in the South being the primary agricultural part of the country, um, there was a fear in the South that if you had too high of a tariff, uh, Europeans would raise their tariffs and then you couldn't trade with them anymore. Um, and what this leads to is, uh, the nullification crisis over this tariff of abominations. Um, so what you get is that, uh, South Carolina and its governor, a guy named Robert Hayne, as well as their senator, John C. Calhoun, which had originally been Jackson's vice president. He actually resigned and went back to become a senator of South Carolina for the crisis. Um, they will push South Carolina as a state to nullify the tariff of abominations uh, and basically say, we're not going to follow it. Now, that is a direct challenge to the federal government because we do know that in the Constitution, the federal government has the authority to tax. Um, so what South Carolina is basically saying is we don't have to follow any of the federal government's rules, even though they're in the constitution, you know, South Carolina is always causing trouble. Um, so Jackson responds by saying you are in violation of the constitution and goes one step farther and basically says that Hayne and Calhoun are committing treason. And he pushes what's called the force bill through the Congress. Um, what that does is that authorizes him to send troops down to seize control of South Carolina um, and arrest these guys. And remember, when you declare tre that someone's treasonous in the 1830s, treason was punishable by death. So in essence, what Jackson said was, I'm going to arrest and execute the senator and governor of South Carolina, or one of the senators. Um, that's a big deal because, you know, this is the president of the United States. Um, so Henry Clay is going to step in and ease these tensions. Uh, and what Clay does is he basically creates a proposal where he says, we're going to lower the tariffs gradually, and South Carolina agrees. Um, and then in exchange, Jackson won't like, you know, go to South Carolina and, and arrest Calhoun and, uh, and Hain. Um, but South Carolina is kind of a parting shot and snub to Jackson, um, will uh, nullify the force bill. It's symbolic because Jackson wasn't going to go and invade anyway anymore because of what had happened. 
Um, but what it does is it keeps the idea of uh, nullification alive, um, which we know is eventually going to be one of the, the main catalysts and justifications for secession. Um, so like this isn't going away is what we're getting at. So uh, after nullification, we have the Indian Removal Act and the crisis. Um, Indian removal is probably the most, uh, the most infamous action of Jackson, even more so than the banks. Um, and, and what this centers on is, um, basically the, the realization if people hadn't figured it out yet, that native Americans were never going to have a place in the United States, unfortunately, um, no matter what they did, that's kind of the tragedy of the Indian removal act. So, um, remember Jackson is vehemently against native Americans. He had fought in wars against native Americans. He did not believe they had a place in the United States. He wanted to remove them so that Western farmers could have more land. Um, oddly, he also adopted an, uh, a Native American orphan boy at one point. Um, so like kind of in a personal sense, he's maybe a little more conflicted. Um, but I don't think that he was not vehemently anti-Native American. Um, and uh, the Indian Removal Act in 1830 is a really good example of this. Um, you know, I'd say it's maybe the darkest chapter in the relations between the United States and Native Americans in North America. Um, so in, uh, in 1830, uh, this act is passed called the Indian Removal Act, which um, provides federal money and support to remove uh, a group that's now known as the Five Civilized Tribes from Georgia and the American South. Um, these are the Cherokee, the Creek, the Seminole, the Chickasaw, and the Choctaw. Um, now, what made them different and why were they called the five civilized tribes? Uh, they had assimilated to American culture. Um, basically, unlike a lot of the other tribes that had resisted, these tribes came to the conclusion that there was no way they were going to defeat the United States, which is true. Um, and what they said was, well, let's assimilate and that way we can stay on our land in some form. Uh, they Christianized, uh, they adopted like white Southern culture, um, like all the way they wore American style dress. They got rid of communal property. You know, that was always a big issue. Um, so they gave themselves individual land within their tribes. Um, they established plantations. Um, I mean, it's not a good thing, but it was their attempt to assimilate to the South. They actually, in many cases had slaves, um, you know, they basically attempted to imitate Southern planters. And their thought was that if they did that, they could be accepted into, you know, white American society. Um, and in Georgia, I mean, there's no other way to put it. Farmers got jealous and they wanted their land. Um, so Georgia pushes to get rid of them. And then the Indian Removal Act is passed, which basically gives the federal support. Um, and then here, this is, I mean, this is kind of adds to the tragedy. They didn't resist. They didn't militarily fight back. They didn't rebel. Um, they did what you're supposed to do. They sued. They went to the federal government and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, and in two cases, uh, the Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, and then the more famous of the two, what's called Worcester v. Georgia, they actually win Supreme Court cases. Uh, the Marshall Court orders that you cannot remove them. They've done everything you've asked. Um, you can't take their property away. So the Supreme Court actually does its job and backs these uh, these tribes. And Jackson basically says, the hell with it. Um, and the famous line is, he says, uh, Justice Marshall has made his decision, let him enforce it, um, which basically defies the Supreme Court and says, I have an army, I'm the president, Justice Marshall is a judge, he has no real power. Um, and Jackson will order the military in and they will forcibly remove these five tribes from Georgia. Um, to add insult to injury, they actually force them to move during the winter, uh, which makes it much more difficult. And thousands of people die that did not need to die. Um, because remember, winter in the 1830s is a little different than it is now with disease, things like that. Uh, and he forcibly sends all of them to Oklahoma, um, which kind of permanently destroys these tribes. Um, you know, nothing against Oklahoma, but it's not nearly as good for farmland as Georgia. All these tribes had gotten very used to um, and had assimilated into where they were. And then they were just kind of displaced into this new area with no resources to develop it. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like 
pulling the root out of a plant. You know, if it doesn't have the ability to, to grow anymore, how, how's it going to survive? Um, and, uh, and so these tribes are destroyed. And, uh, and like I said, in, in a lot of ways, it's the darkest chapter of at least this period in time with Native American history, maybe ever. You know, it's right up there with things like the, um, uh, the Battle of Wounded Knee or the Massacre at Wounded Knee, um, you know, the deliberate spreading of smallpox, you know, things like that. Um, so, uh, so what it does is it kind of confirms to most Native American groups now that are left, like the, the Americans are not to be trusted and they'll never let us have a place in, in the United States. Um, now the third major piece of, um, Jackson's administration has to do with the bank. Um, you know, that Jackson was against the elite. He was against not just Southern planters, but Northern businessmen. And as a result, he was also against the bank. Um, Jackson was what was called a hard money advocate. Um, he didn't trust paper money. He didn't trust banks loaning. Uh, he'd actually lost all of his money in a panic in the late 1700s, which we think kind of influenced his views. So when he becomes president, he sets out to destroy the Bank of the United States. Um, so, you know, it was chartered in 1816 and uh, it was due for a recharter in 1836. However, that would be the end of Jackson's two terms. Um, and Jackson came out publicly in uh, his first term and said, when it comes around, he intends to reject the new charter for the bank. Um, and Henry Clay and uh, another senator from Massachusetts by the name of Webster, um, and then a bunch of other northern kind of businessmen um, said, this is our chance to beat Jackson. Um, we're going to apply for a new bank charter now. Um, before the election of 1832, and we're going to make it a campaign issue, and most Americans will side with us because they know we need a bank, uh, and they were wrong. Uh, Jackson, they vastly underestimated his support of common commoners. Jackson will easily beat Henry Clay in 1832, and what that also does is that gives him a mandate to destroy the bank. Um, so after the election, he orders his Secretary of Treasury to uh, destroy the bank, um, and his secretary says, absolutely not. Uh, you're going to create a financial panic. So he fires him. He then asks his next treasury secretary to do the same thing. He is rejected again and he fires him. Uh, and then last, he will appoint um, this guy Taney, who you know is the chief justice of the Supreme Court, um, to be his new treasury secretary. And Taney pulls out all the federal money from the bank. Uh, he's rewarded with the nomination to the Supreme Court. That's how he gets on the court. Remember, he's the guy for Dred Scott. So, you know, Jackson appoints a bum to the Supreme Court for helping him destroy the bank. Um, and, uh, and Taney will uh, gradually pull all the federal money out. And remember, if you pull the money out of the bank, the bank has no purpose. Um, so he basically bleeds the American National Bank dry, or the Bank of the United States, um, and then puts all of that money into... Um, what are called pet banks, which are basically private banks of people that support Jackson. And the irony of this is that Jackson didn't trust the National Bank, and then he put American money into all these riskier banks. Um, and, uh, and what this is ultimately going to do is he will leave office, very popular in 1836, um, and then in 1837 there's going to be this panic that's a direct result because – um, in conjunction with pulling all the federal money out of the banks, because he didn't trust paper money, he also pushed for what was called the specie circular, which said that any land bought from the federal government, and remember, that's how the federal government made money back then, it sold all that western land, uh, had to be paid for with gold or silver. And what all of these pet banks had been doing is they had been loaning out way more money than they had. Um, and so all of a sudden, when you can't use borrowed money, you got to pay for stuff basically in you know, cash up front. Um, it causes a land price crash. The banks call in all their loans. No one has any money to pay it. Um, and basically, the United States gets bankrupted and turned into uh, a major financial depression. Um, Van Buren, who was Jackson's handpicked successor, is the guy who bears the brunt of this. Um, he is blamed. He's only a one-term president as a result. Um, so it's not a, uh, you know, uh, a good presidency for him. Um, but the irony is that really it's all Jackson's fault. Um, basically Jackson just kind of like gets off the ship before it sinks. Um, 
and uh, and what that does is that kind of leads us into the the 1840s. We'll get into the the political things um, in the next unit, um, but uh, but you know the the Jacksonian era um, really in a lot of ways ends with a with this massive like financial panic. Um, so kind of as we start to wind down for the for the lecture, and I know this one's a little long, so thanks for sticking it out. Um, as we look into the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, kind of culturally, um, we see a lot of the con of the uh, the continuation of some of the things that were going on in the early 1800s. Um, you start to see a uh, a big increase in industrialization, particularly in the north. Um, you start to see a uh, a big increase in the population. Um, to give you an idea, the average family at this point in American history was having six or seven kids. Um, so huge population explosions. Um, you also see that first really major wave of immigration take place um, from Ireland and from Germany in the 1830s and 40s. Um, and, and really by the 1850s, the United States is, is starting to come close to 30 million people, which is a significant amount of people for that time period in history. Um, we'll get into it more in the next unit, but you also see the beginnings of nativism as a result. Um, you know, it's the same nativism that we talked about in the Gilded Age. This is just kind of the first wave of it. Um, but it's kind of kept in a little more check than it was after the Civil War because the economy is growing so rapidly through railroads, uh, you know, steam lines, canal building, industry, um, that there's, there's just so much demand for labor um, that, uh, you know, economically people are, are doing pretty well. And we know that that in a lot of ways is one of the main sources of nativism. Um, so uh, as we look to the South kind of culturally with the North, you know, industrializing and becoming more diverse, um, the South is becoming more and more rooted in slavery and in cotton. Um, really by the, by the mid 1800s, cotton has become what we now know as king cotton, right? Um, where it is the sole crop in many parts of the South. It is the dominant crop in the entire South. And the entire Southern economy is kind of rooted in how much cotton can be produced. Um, and what this does is this kind of, you know, permanently ingrained slavery in Southern society, both legally, economically, and even culturally. Um, what it essentially does is it ensures that you need to have a civil war to end slavery. You know, the South was never going to abolish slavery as a result of this. Um, and, uh, and in this time period, the South had a tremendous amount of economic clout because of how much money came into the country from cotton exports. So it was very hard for even abolitionists to kind of, you know, reject this or resist this. Um, so when we look at, um, you know, the, the Second Great Awakening, uh, and this is kind of where we'll wrap up for the day. Um, We'll, we'll talk a little bit about abolition. We'll talk about some of the other kind of movements, just an overview. Um, so um, we initially looked at some of the religious things related to the Second Great Awakening, but really this is something that continues all the way through the 1830s and goes back to that idea of like, what does it mean to be an American and how do you um, create a unique American culture? Um, and we see it in a lot of different kind of cultural areas, um, gender roles. We see it in religion. We see it in art, literature. Um, so, uh, so we'll do a, a brief overview of all of these. Um, so in the United States, in an artistic sense, um, you see transcendentalism really play a major role in literature and, uh, and also in art. Um, we have the Hudson River School, which is kind of that idea of drawing uh, or painting, you know, scenery, uh, nature. Um, in literature, you see, um, this push of like becoming, you know, full and complete and fulfilled through, uh, interaction with nature. Um, so we see things like, you know, Moby Dick, uh, Last of the Mohicans, you know, all these books with really strong kind of nature themes. Um, I think I talked about this during the Gilded Age. Um, and then when we talked about like the preservation of the national parks, um, uh, in a lot of ways, transcendentalism in the United States, um, creates a, uh, an idea that, look, we don't really have unique forms of art at this point. And, you know, obviously we talked about jazz later. Um, and, and we don't really, because we're a nation of immigrants, have a unique cultural identity because everybody brought, you know, ideas from other places. That in itself is unique, you know, the melting pot idea. But like, 
you know, we don't have hundreds and hundreds of years of history or thousands of years of history like most places in the world. Um, so what do we have? And what transcendentalists said was that, you know, we have nature, you know, whereas in most places in the world, they are now starting to become overpopulated. The wilderness has been destroyed. Um, we have the West. We have the wilderness. Um, and that can be kind of our unique cultural thing. You know, it's why we have the national park system in a lot of ways. You know, we talked about that with Teddy Roosevelt. Um, so this is kind of where you see that seed planted for the, the stronger than in most places in the world connection to, to nature in the United States and to, like I said, kind of like the wilderness, the frontier. Um, it was seen as like a character building thing, you know, like rugged individualism to go to something we'll look at later um, in a lot of ways is rooted in transcendentalism too. Um, and, uh, and that idea of kind of like setting out on your own and you see it in things other than nature too. Um, like the Mormons are a good example of this, right? The Mormons are the first really unique American religion. Um, and, and really the most successful uniquely American religion to this day, um, where like they go into the wilderness out to Utah. I mean, they were persecuted tremendously in the, in the East, but they, they go to Utah and like carve out an existence, right? Um, you know, you have like some of those, uh, you remember reading about like Brook Farm and like, you know, some of like the communal living and like utopias in the 1830s and 40s, the same idea, go into the wilderness, carve out a new society, um, kind of like new colonists. Um, so you see a lot of arguments there um, or, or, or kind of pushes there for, um, you know, using the wilderness to achieve some sort of success or fulfillment. Um, you see kind of coming out of the, the Second Great Awakening, a lot of pushes for reform, right? Um, we see the push for greater public education with guys like Horace Mann. Um, that's probably the most successful of them. Um, the United States has an over 90% literacy rate by the Civil War. It's actually about 95%, uh, which was incredibly high for the 1800s. Um, you see the asylum movement with like Dorothea Dix trying to improve prisons. Um, you also see for the first time um, the birth of feminism with the suffrage movement being born in the 1830s, kind of going hand in hand also with the abolition movement being born in the 1830s, um, which we'll get into both of those a little bit later in more depth. Um, but really think of the Second Great Awakening as planting a lot of the seeds for reform movements that become much, much more influential after the Civil War. All right. Um, okay. Okay. So why don't we stop there? That's a decent overview. I mean, we've talked, obviously, you know, you, you got to review your notes and things like that too, but that should be a good introduction. Um, so hopefully this was useful to kind of introduce some of those big topics and, uh, and we'll go from there and I will talk to you soon.